So Liana is one of our very own Billy Blue College of Design at Torrens University alumni. And she totally embodies the spirit of our namesake. She is a disruptor and an agitator and Liana's anti-social media prowess proves you can carve your own path into a career that you love. Uh, she's a BNT 30 under 30 Grand Prix winner from 2020. And uh, she currently is the head of content at uh, Tasmania's Mona, which is the Museum of Old and New Art. I am Liana Rossi. I'm the head of content at Mona, which is the Museum of Old and New Art in Nipaluna, Hobart. I actually attended an event just like this maybe six years ago and heard one of my now colleagues speak and thought about working at Mona um, at that time for the first time and that was in the campus in Ultimo. So this is a pretty nice full circle moment for me uh, to come back and be able to talk to you guys. It is hard for me to imagine a more chaotic or creative place to work and live than Hobart and at Mona, uh, which is something I probably wouldn't have said six years ago, but I've been here for a while now and <laughs> certainly um, become my place. I studied a Bachelor of Design and majored in the branded environment, which I'm not sure if that's still a, a thing. Um, but it gave me a little bit of everything and that was really what I needed. I have a pretty short attention span, which is very suited to working on the internet. And I'm a jack of all trades, master of some. This is my favourite quote and I really hope my dad tuned in to watch this because when I was failing my HSC in 2008, he told me I would never get a job on MySpace and I went on to work on Facebook. So I feel vindicated each time I get to wheel this one out. I all but failed that HSC because I was coding HTML and learning how to do CSS code so that my face, my MySpace, sorry, looked uh, very cool for my friends at school. Um, and yeah, my dad told me I'd never get a job doing that. He was wrong, but it was a winding road from there. I was really committed to being an architect. I did try that. I went to university for a year in an architecture course. And in that time, I went and got an internship at my favorite architectural magazine. But the only place they could put me was in the marketing team. I ended up creating a Facebook friend page for them before brands were on Facebook, which in hindsight is relatively creepy. Um, but in that time, social media and the internet more broadly have really gone from the wild west to being heavily scrutinized, heavily invested in, and now one of the largest mediums for advertising. It took, yeah, somewhere in the middle for me to land on the job that I'm in now. So when I started at Billy Blue, uh, in one of my first lectures, a teacher told me to just go and get design jobs um, and in retrospect anyone that worked with me was probably pretty kind when I was stuffing up printing wallpaper for a bar but I really threw myself into it with full force. Um, so during my time at Billy Blue I was doing various content production, design work, print, socials, PR, on the door of events, anything I could get my hands on and then I landed myself into Present Company which was an agency made up of six people uh, in a little room in Surrey Hills. I, I believe that they're like at 50 or 60 staff now, um, but we were a bunch of probably unqualified, basically teenagers uh, making content. We made memes for Pringles, um, kind of questionable stuff now. And I think in the time that I've been working online, the budgets have grown, it's been taken seriously, and I've kind of ridden this roller coaster of being embarrassed to be a social media person, to wanting to be a head of content. So it's been quite the journey. From there, I went to DDB Sydney in the same building as the Ultimo Billy Blue campus and would bump into all my old lecturers in the hallway. And then I went on to work with my mentor as a director doing activation-based work, uh, more experiential social media ideas until I got a phone call on a Sunday afternoon from my now boss at Mona, who said someone had recommended me for a job I told him I'd take a free weekend, uh, but I'd never live in Tasmania. And I've now been here for four years, more recently as the head of content. So needless to say, 
it's been, uh, if you're a Shit's Creek fan, it's been a very Alexis journey for me moving from uh, Big Bad Surrey Hills to Hobart, but I love Tasmania more than anything now and can't imagine being anywhere else. My boss is a gambler. So if you don't know much about Mona, that's probably all you need to know. Uh, we are very much employed to activate at his whim. It is chaotic and it is creative. There is some design, but there's not a lot of order. When you're talking to a gambler, he's always interested in risk and asymmetric upside. So this is language we use a lot at work. And I think we back the asymmetric upside of creativity. Uh, we aren't necessarily traditional marketers and we're encouraged to let me directly quote and blame the swearing on him, fuck it up real good. Uh, so that's the kind of way that we approach our creative work. What can we push? How hard can we go? So while we're mainly known for being David Walsh's private museum, we're actually a lot of things. So I hope you can see this. We are a terrible parking lot. We are three restaurants, we are a wine bar, we are a burger joint, we are a summer music festival, we are luxury pavilions, a function centre, we are ferries, we are a gift shop. That's a tennis court which is not art and there's a concrete mixer which is. There's also Marilla Winery on site, we have Domain A Winery off site, we have a craft brewery which was founded in 2005, the list goes on. Um, so we're a very small team, there is 16 of us in Mona's communication department and we make almost everything in-house. Uh, so it is not a stay in your lane job. It is jumping all over the place. It is styling shoots. It's handling a boar's eyeball. Um, it's fighting with Facebook about the shape of soaps. Uh, and it's making fun of your boss in an EDM for his self-indulgent autobiography, which weighs six kilos and breaks coffee tables. So it's certainly keeps me on my toes and has allowed me to really flex some skills that I may have had kind of sitting idle, um, but it's really opened my horizons to what you can do in a nimble and small team. So we have these guiding principles in the way that we work. Um, they are show, don't tell, be honest, don't pander to the audience, know by doing, and don't drift to the middle. So we kind of use this when we look at each of our briefs, when we look at the work we're putting out into the world, the way that we approach social media. We're not very regular Instagram posters. We come out when we have something to say, uh, not just for the sake of it. We like to use a barbell technique of really low and highbrow, um, and we like to have fun amongst it all. So if you've been to Mona in the past six years, you may have seen Tim before. Tim is an artwork, or well, his back is. Uh, he is a work by the artist Vim Delvoir, and for six months of the year, he sits on a box in the museum. In my first few weeks at Mona, I got a task to make a Facebook poke with, post with a link um, to talk about Tim's talks that he was doing. It's the only time of the day Tim got to talk to anyone. I was like, why doesn't anyone know this? Why have we never filmed him? Does he speak? Like, let's do this. And I had a one hour conversation with Tim, which turned into a three minute short piece of content. We sold out all of the talks. Tim also decided he would never speak again. So there's no more use for this content. But in that, uh, it's been picked up. It's been used, this footage has been used in films. It's been used in, you know, press for The Guardian. Um, and Tim is so committed to his craft of sitting that during COVID last year, we live streamed him uh, for the entire time. Our summer music festival, Mona Foma, moved to Launceston uh, in 2018, 2018, 2019, officially, uh, 2018 soft launch. People are skeptical of a Tasmanian summer, let alone one in Launceston. Uh, so to drive interest in the festival and try and get people thinking about partying with their mates, we developed Air Mofo. Uh, we gave an entire plane's worth of seats away on our airline where no one flies higher. We brought it back in 2020 and filled a plane again. This time one person won it. Uh, he had to find, I think it was 156 friends to bring with him to the festival. We filled the plane. 
to get this kind of stuff out into the market and we worked with our partners at Tourism Tasmania. We used really Tasmanian landscapes with a great production company called The Glue Society in Sydney to make these fun ads full of clues um, to then find our plane on a map and the quickest person to find it won the entire plane. So I'm just going to play you a spot that we made for that. Sisa <laughs> That's a shot of the inside of the plane on the first year full of the winners. So I think it's a it's a really great example of not a traditional way to advertise a music festival. It's also fun, it is excitable and it's the kind of thing that we really jump at the opportunity to do and I think as we work together as a team really closely um, the creatives I work with my boss Robbie Brammel and my colleague Jarden Anderson um, have a lot of fun have a lot of flex lean on the pillars of our brand and we're able to create some really exciting stuff I don't know if any of you remember but we were one of the first arts organizations to close during COVID, or pre-COVID almost, uh, thanks to the mathematician that we work for. <clears throat> so when you work for an art gallery that's close to the general public and restaurants and the such, in a world that didn't feel like it needed to close quite yet, we spent a lot of time working out what we were gonna do for that year and how we were gonna keep ourselves employed, basically. Uh, when Tasmania started to gently reopen the state internally. Uh, we worked with our chef at Faro to develop uh, an experimental dining experience for locals to get back out, get dressed up. We didn't really know what it was going to be, but we were okay with that. It's the no by doing philosophy. So we couldn't really promise them the food and we couldn't even really show them what they were going to eat, but we needed them to pre-book for months in advance. So the Faro Experiments was born and we ran a campaign asking people to be experimented on, basically, our lab rats. So the um, red kind of triangle you can see there is not the Illuminati, it is the shape of the restaurant. We had collateral that was made with legal waivers and we ran these ads locally to get people excited and also really lean into it. And during the experiential dinners, there was people who'd take you down dark corridors and all kinds of sorts of fun things that would happen, but in a one day, six hour shoot, all filmed and edited by our videographer, Jenny Hun Jesse Hunniford, using Mona staff who'd been stood down, we managed to make this. Stars shining bright above you, night breezes seem to whisper, I love you. Birds singing in the circumstances, dream a little dream more. Along the theme of using stood down staff, we then launched a fashion shoot for our very standard hoodies and t-shirts. This was the Mona JobKeeper collection in which we created a parody uh, fashion campaign featuring staff who were really desperate to get back on site and get amongst the action feeling really cooped up in their houses. So we have some pretty sexy advertising of mugs and scarves and of as much of an internal engagement piece as a successful um, campaign there. We also had ad placements that we had paid for, so we've famously been on that billboard at Hobart Airport forever. 
So when we launched our new Mubru IPA during lockdown, we used those placements for the literal three people who may have gone through the airport. Again, these were really simple and fun things that we did in a very agile way. We thought about what we had, we worked with what we did. It's a really photoshoppy job um, and it ran in the airport for a few months. So I think we were able to channel some of that energy and keep it going as a collective team during the last sort of year. And I think that that's been really important to the process and in terms of chaos, I'm just not knowing day to day. And also not being a government institution, we had no mandate to reopen, so we weren't sure that we ever would. Um, so that year of running at every brief in a, sorry, those are my dogs, <laughs> running at every brief in a, in a chaotic and energetic way really kept us going um, and kept the dream alive. I guess in summary for me, my own principles have evolved since I've been here. Um, it's to lean into the chaos, become a chaos agent, just run with it, push your boundaries. I've, I've been doing hairstyling, I've been doing things that I'm certainly not qualified to do and wouldn't like to do forever, but I've really flexed and honed my skills by going outside of my comfort zone. I've embraced collaboration. The team that we work with is so incredible and no one can do everything by themselves. And I think that's another really crucial part of your creative career. It takes the collaborators, it takes the people that you work with. Surround yourself with good ones and don't drift to the fucking middle. Liana, thank you so much for sharing that, that with us. I just, I think that those key takeaways, leaning into the chaos, pushing your boundaries, I think it's just such good advice for anyone really but particularly for our students and our graduates as they're pursuing their career or graduates who want to pursue that kind of big old approach but might not be working for a company that is quite so um uh, open to that or if they're wanting to create their own really big bold style themselves I, I think it is it is very relative. Like I did come from making ads for McDonald's, um, which were not what I do now. Uh, I think that, in fact, the problem I had when I got to Mona was I couldn't think big enough. I was so used to working within constraints that it took me a while to step backwards from the world that I came from and clients and what's appropriate, uh, what you do put into the world and actually learn to work in the creative way that I have since I've been here. I would say pursuing your own interests and making things outside of your job that you take is the most important thing, whether it's, you know, writing, I edit film at home, I try to keep going. Also for what I want to do, and I think that that really helps you to then bring your own tone and develop your creativity. Yeah, in terms of finding employers to do this kind of stuff, um, find a billionaire, maybe a millionaire, and um, I reckon latch on would be my advice. I wish I could remember the name of the lecturer that told me to start working as soon as I could because I would probably kiss them right now. I think that in tandem learning, and this is what I was talking about, doing your own projects and keeping your own craft and interest going because if you're learning and working in tandem, I think your results are much better and you get places faster. Um, I mean, I'm really grateful that I was able to do a design degree that had, I did typography lessons, like I did 3D in order, 3DS Max and AutoCAD and I was designing ESOP stores. I'm pretty sure I actually emailed them one, never heard back, but I was just shooting my shot from the get go. And I think that being able to apply a really diverse skill set, like my job didn't exist when I enrolled the job that I have now. Advertising agencies had head of TV, they didn't have head of content. I've been on the journey as it's happening and it allowed me to be quite agile and again, lean into that chaos to get to the creativity. Um, my path wasn't linear into advertising and it certainly wasn't linear to the arts. So it's, um, yeah, I think that learning a bit of everything was really helpful. Mm -hmm.